Good morning. How are you? All right. I love the enthusiasm because you've got A1 business for the next three hours. Right? Yeah. I exciting. So uh, thanks for the no introduction introduction. I appreciate that. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, Derek Crowder, I am the A1 senior enlisted leader. And I start every brief when I talk about A1 with this. I am a 2S material manager living in an A1 world. Soup, soup. Nice. Thank you three for being here. I love that. That's awesome. But anyway, so I had the honor and privilege of spending a few hours with you today to talk about the A1 portfolio. The A1 portfolio is absolutely huge, right? Everything with manpower, personnel, and services, right? We heard Mac give a 30-minute brief on AFPC, and I don't know about what you heard, but let me tell you what I heard. If AFPC doesn't give you what you want, it's Derek's fault. That's what I heard. Uh, and that's kind of true. Not my fault, but the A1 does policy, and AFPC is the execution arm for my boss, Lieutenant General Brian Kelly, the Deputy Chief of Staff for Manpower, Personnel, and Services. And so I'm going to spend a few minutes this morning talking to you, about 10, and then I'm going to turn it over to my teammate, Stephen Blazer. He's our Chief of Enlisted Force Development, and he's going to talk about the great things that our A1D team is getting after, DSD reform, Enlisted Force Development Action Plan. And so he's going to take that first hour, and then I'll come back on the stage for the last two hours, and I'll give you an update of, of quite a bit of stuff that's happening within the A1 portfolio. But before I turn it over to him, let me just kind of give you a, a brief introduction. We're going to talk a little bit about the influential landscape, things that have happened in 2021 that have impacted decisions and programs within the A1. Then we're going to look at force development. I'll turn it over to, to Blaze, and then we'll talk about force management. And then I'm going to spend a majority of the time talking about action order A, airmen, right? There's a lot of things that fit into that box of action order A, airmen, and we'll spend most of the time talking about that. And then I have a slide that has six or seven topics, and I'll just throw those out there, some hot topics, things that are on our mind, so you know where our headspace is at within the A1, things that we're moving forward with right now, right, that may happen in, in 22, it may happen in 23, and so there's about seven things that I'll spend a little time talking about there. But let me just talk about the landscape. I want you to look at this slide, and this is 2021, right? These are things in the last year that have impacted decisions and programs within the A1. And let's start with January. We're 13 months removed from the Capitol raid, right? January 6th of last year. How's that an A1 thing? We had extremism, right? We did training on extremism. That came, our team was part of that. Our team in A1Z, our resiliency partners, were part of that extremism training, right? That affected you and the organizations, and so that was, a, that was an impact. We had a new administration, new president comes in, right? We get a new Secretary of Defense. We get a new Secretary of the Air Force, a new Under Secretary of the Air Force. Why are those important? Well, when you think about it, when we're talking about uh, the Secretary of Defense, one of the things that he's mentioned when he took office was he wants to eliminate sexual assault and sexual harassment within our formations. Why is that important, A1? Well, because who owns Resiliency, again, A1Z, our A1Z teammates own resiliency, and so that's one of those things. And that's just from the SECDEF. And then you had uh, SAPR, right, Independent Review Commission, IRC. And I will tell you here, 83 recommendations came out of that IRC. 83 recommendations to combat sexual assault and sexual harassment. And it's going to take a few years to work through those things, but that was a mandated uh, review of the actual SAPR program. And then you had troops in Afghanistan, right, departing Afghanistan in August. COVID vaccination, mandatory vaccine, right? November 2nd, get your vaccine, get your religious or medical exemption in for a waiver for the vaccine. That's important. That played a factor. We had the RDR in December of 20. We had the DR in September of 21, right? And then we had the addendum. We had the DR, I think, in, yeah, in September, and then we had the addendum in October that overlaid both of those, took the RDR and the DR, overlaid both of those, and then said, okay, where are the real problems? Where is it consistent between the RDR and the DR? And so that right there is, is kind of the landscape. But, oh, by the way, look at the very top of that. Let's not forget about great power competition because those are things that you're focused on. Those are things that, that your airmen are focused on, and all of the other stuff is also things that you're focused on. So there is a lot going on 
in our world today. And this kind of just sets the stage. And this is the same slide that my boss gives when he briefs the wing commander and the group commander conferences. So anytime that we're out, we put this slide up first and talk about this is the landscape over the last year. All of these things listed up here affect what we do in the A1. What we do in the A1 affects you and your organization right, because of the manpower, personnel, and services piece, right? And so that's why I want you to understand, here's kind of the landscape. I assure you, we do not sit up in the Pentagon and think about ways that we cannot take care of your airmen, right? You may feel that way sometimes, right? And I'll be honest with you, we don't do that. We don't do that. And so when we get to the questions and answers after I do about an hour and a half, I'm going to try to leave 30 minutes for Q&A. There's going to be some things, as I said, I, I'm a loggy living in an A1 world, and it has been eye-opening for me over the last eight months I've been doing this job, how big the A1 portfolio is. And one of the things that I will tell you that uh, Chief Hoagie at AFPC, when he was at AFPC, used to say it all the time, personnel is personal. And it absolutely is. Things that we do in the A1 portfolio, they are emotional to people, right? EFMP, that's emotional to people. Talent management, that's emotional to people. When we take over AFIPS from FM, I hope that's not too emotional for people, meaning we still get people paid, right? But those are all some of the challenges that we have within the A1 world. And so when we get to questions, here's my promise to you. I don't know everything. And here's my advice to you. You don't either as a chief, right? Don't pretend to know everything. It's okay. And you're going to hear me say it today. It's okay to say, I don't know, but I'll get you an answer. I've got folks on speed dial back in the Pentagon. I've got email. I've got phones, everything that you have as well. I can reach folks and get you the answer, right? And so that's my advice to you when you go back. You don't, get, you don't take a magic pill as a chief and learn everything overnight, right? People think you do, but you don't. And so I'm not afraid to tell you I don't know the answer to that because this portfolio, when you look at it across the enterprise, when you talk about funding and stuff, you know, things like that, it's about 30% of the Air Force portfolio is in, within the A1. So it's absolutely huge, and so that's why they give me three hours, and it's an honor and privilege to get to spend some time with you, and, and hopefully we'll have a little bit of fun. Uh, I know Blaze is very passionate about what he does when we talk about enlisted force development, and so I'm going to get off the stage. I'm going to turn it over to Blaze, and, and just my personal opinion, I've known Blaze for quite a few years. I would argue that there's not a better person in our Air Force, someone that cares about enlisted force development more than that man right there. And so with that, I'm going to get off the stage, and Blaze, you got it. There's one person who believes you. There we go. There we go. Good morning. How are we doing? Man, all right. Man, what? Copy. Yeah. Big green button. Okay. All right. There's actually two green buttons on this. It's kind of funny. Okay. What more would I rather do than start this morning by talking to over 400 brand new chiefs? The answer to that is a lot. There's a lot of things I would rather do. I would, I would rather take my wife on a date. I would rather throw the football with my kids. Um, but that doesn't mean that I'm not extremely excited to spend some time with some, some teammates here. Hey, I just want to be able to say, you know, this is definitely an honor to be up here spending time with you. Really important, I think, time and change for us to kind of seek to understand each other, right? Uh, seek to help uh, and not seek to judge, if I'm honest with you. Sometimes we get in these, these sessions uh, and I, especially as chiefs, and I think it's because we grew up seeing it this way, right? You know, a lot of times that chief, you're looking at him, and you've, you've, you know, you've, you've engaged, and they're kind of like this, right? You know what I'm talking about? Like Caesar? You know what I'm talking about? And you're in the arena. You know what I'm talking about? Right? So we got any maintenance in here? What? Defenders? What? Prior shirts? What? Right? We got Soup Soup, the three. Medical? ISR, finance, cyber, any of that? We got some wingman leader warriors in here? Hey, this has got to be all about us. I hope you guys understand this conversation today and everything we're talking about in the people business, this is about us. And so as chiefs, it's really, really important. You're going to have access like you've never had before, okay? But I, but I would also would say that, that in this portfolio, you know, I'm, I'm an ISR guy. We've got a lot of different people, but this is not a tribal conversation. Right? This is not a one-sided community conversation. This is an enterprise conversation. And so uh, this is only going to happen, the things we're going to go over here today, uh, if we choose to make it happen. First thing I want to be able to say is just thank you on behalf of this entire team. Um, there, there, is, there is no one person, and one thing I love that, that, that SimSaf always talks about is better together. 
And that has been proven through this last year. Uh, we've been, we've been wor working on this project for about a year. And the original goal was, hey, get after building an enlisted force development strategy. That was a go-do. We've never really had kind of a, uh, a strategy for change. If you look at the PME that you've gone to, when was that built? When was that dreamed up? When was that fought for, advocated, resourced? Were you born? Right? We would argue, is that what we need for today? Has the world changed and moved around us? Is there a different way we need to do things? And so the original challenge to this team was to think about not just defending what we have, but thinking about what we really need. Because the fight for 2030 is already happening right now. Right? Those airmen are already here with us. And the Air Force that we are, we are cultivating today, we will give to them. And we know that, right? We came in knowing that, hey, you got to leave it better than you found it. And I know we fight and live that every single day. But the big part of this plan is to make sure that there's shared understanding. Because we honestly, we suck at communication. In this information age, we've got to flatten comms, right? Email and forward and for your essay is not going to get it done. We've got to be able to flatten comms. So that's one big part of this too. But on behalf of this team, I just want to be able to say a lot of things we've been doing. Um, SimSAF, thank you so much for, for plusing this team up. Um, I, I think it's been truly, truly special. So we want to share some of the things we've been getting after today. Enlisted force development. So I think one thing that's pointed out is there's a difference between, we all got to understand, there's a difference between force development, force management, talent management, right? And so specifically, talking about what force development is. So I saw some of y'all in the gym this morning. Some of y'all getting after it. Who, hands up if you went to the gym this morning. Okay, good stuff, good stuff. I think, you know, if you think about it, force development, what do you traditionally think of with force development? Just shout it out. If you say force development, what is that? I mean, you can read on the slide. Somebody can cheat now, right? I went too early. What's that? Training. Training. At your unit level, do you talk about force development very much? What do you think? OK, at least some honest answers, right? So, so no, maybe, kind of, right? But one thing I want to be able to say is so those who went to the gym this morning, right, they probably educated themselves on, hey, what are my goals? What am I trying to get after? Let me see if I can watch some YouTube videos or get some pay service to give me some coaches, right? And then I'm going to get a kind of training plan, and I'm going to see, you know, some kind of techniques. And then I'm going to get after it, right? I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to get in there and train. I'm going to have an experience, and then I'm going to reassess. What we do in force development is the integration of those three things, training, education, and experience. A lot of times this topic, people think this is AT, ATC business. People think this is, so I was the guy sitting at BMT answering the phone through COVID. And you don't know how many times, anybody know how long BMT is? Seven and a half weeks. Do you know how many times people would call me and tell me what we had to do to fix our airmen in BMT? All the time. As the second Air Force Command Chief, she could tell you she got those calls all the time. Right? Operational units calling us, telling us what we had to do to fix their airmen. Right? And also, PME. In PME, how many times do we argue, we got to get that into PME? How many days, do you guys know how many days, if you serve 20 years and you become a chief in our Air Force, how many days of PME do you get? 70-something, right? It's like 72 days. We got 7,000 days in between that we got to be taken serious. And that might be at the base level, that might be the unit level, that might be eye-to-eye -eye at a coffee shop with an airman talking. But we got to make force development part of those conversations because it's got to be about reps and sets. It's got to be consistent because airmen are smart. They notice that they get taught, taught something and we don't use it and apply it and we don't validate at the unit level, then they're just going to kick it out. It don't matter. What we do in the units is what matters most. And that's a big part of this. And so one thing I want to be able to tell you is the mission we're on is to make, make this continuous and connected. What goes on in PME? What goes on in some base seminar? What goes on? All has to be connected to a framework. So just food for thought. When you guys progressed from skill level upgrade, right? You guys with me? You guys remember those days? Okay? So you went from five level, seven level. How many of y'all have seven level schools? Hands up. Okay. How many have nine level schools? I'm going to ask you guys a question. What did you have to do to earn your nine level? Live, <laughs> right? Survive, right? Some of you had CBT. Some, how many of y'all had nothing? Nothing. Thinking about that, how much responsibility did you take on when you advanced to be a senior mass sergeant in our Air Force? And how much of that was so much more than just what was outside your career field? 
How much of that became about budgets, about fighting for infrastructure, right? About understanding diverse teams, right? About understanding joint planning. Did you guys have a requirement to be taught any of that? Was that tracked anywhere? And some of the challenge we actually have here, if you look at other models and the services, so the Army selects, train, promote, right? They select who's eligible. Not everybody is going to be automatically eligible. There's actually an endorsement process for that. They train people for the future opportunity, right? And then they promote them. If you look at it, we're, we're inverse. We promote people, and then we tell them you need to train and learn all the stuff you want to be successful in that new rank. It's really hard to motivate somebody when you've already given them the thing. Does that make sense? So we're kind of, we've got to work on that. And that's all things we're looking at, is that it's got to be continuously connected. And the, the highlight on this is that foundational occupational competency, right, building competency, building ability and capability from both an Air Force lens as in leadership progression and both what you're asked to do within your arena and whatever mission set that might be. And it's got to be modernized, right? We've got to harness this world that we operate in to our advantage. you got so many people that have these YouTube pages, Reddits, all this other stuff, and we got to be able to provide something like that within the formation that's, that's valid. Because if not, it actually becomes really, really susceptible uh, for the enemy to start to influence us, especially from disinformation perspective. Okay, so action. So for the you know, you know, old school fans, you might be in your head looking at this slide, thinking about, you know, uh, Red Man, it's time for some action. Anybody with me on that? Okay, all right. Some people got that beat rolling in their head a little bit. Good, good. You know, let that, let that marinate a minute. And for those of you who don't know, you know, you guys, you talk to a friend. Okay. All right, so the journey of this. So go on your phones right now and go into Google. I don't know what the service is in here, but hopefully it's decent. But Enlisted Force Development Action Plan. Right? Enlisted Force Development Action Plan. You can, you can surf it right now. It'll pop up. Uh, once we released it, we actually got decent press from Air Force Times. They, they, they figured out what it was all about. Um, I share it with you is that, you know, this is written not to all airmen. It is written to our leadership teams and those who are, you know, in the business of trans transformation. That's the purpose of this document, right? It's an aspirational document to say, hey, we want specific objectives we're getting after in, in a period of the next two years. But this started from the charge, Chief Master of the Air Force charges in this team. So we had MAGCOM representatives um, thousands of airmen that gave input into building this plan. One call from the team was we were going to make sure this plan was not written by a bunch of old chiefs just sitting in the Pentagon. This was going to be written by the airmen who were going to fly down the runway that we were shaping for the future force. Right? This is their runway. We've got to be thinking about that all the time. And so we want to make sure that it was, that was, that was, it was fused by their inputs. Now, this took a lot of work. We had a lot of different work groups. But driving all the information, we shaped it into six focus areas and 28 objectives, and I'll have that on the next slide. But the big thing I want to be able to highlight, if you look at August when we sat down with General Brown, and I think it's, you know, we got to look at the kind of period we're in right now. We got a chief of staff of the Air Force who said, hey, enlisted business is my business, right? This is airman business. And he endorsed this, and he's, he's been supportive and all about it. But if you notice what he gave, the feedback he said, because this was originally called enlisted force development strategy, his words and his perspective I think is pretty powerful. He says, hey, if you call something a strategy, it's just going to sit on, the, uh, on somebody's desk in the Pentagon. Ain't nobody going to read it. He's like, I want, it, I want this to be actionable. I want it to be achievable. And I want somebody to have ownership. And I want to have timelines on it. And so we continue to push through. Again, I know some of you guys might look at that. It's like, man, it took you all year to write that. But, but hey, either way, we are where we are. We have a plan, and it's out. There's very few people who know the pain, but one day, one day, somebody in this audience will know. Yeah. And then it's been out, the force was released in early January. And so here's a nice Jeopardy chart for you guys, easy access, quick reference. And so you can see the six themes that we're trying to get after. And it's over two years. And so it's about four or five objectives each quarter and if it was up to Chief Master of the Air Force Bass, we would have this done in 90 days. We said, hey, ma'am, can we get two years? And so she was very accommodating. But a couple of things that I'm going to talk about today that I think are applicable to you. And DC, can I get to 910? Will you let me steal a little bit of time? Is he here? Oh, he's not here, so I'm, t I'm taking it. I'm going. OK. But here's some of the areas I'm going to talk about today. If anybody has any questions on any of these, Again, they're broken out page by page. Uh, 
I'll be here uh, tomorrow as well, so feel free to engage with me if you, if you need to understand kind of the intent of what we're trying to get after. Uh, but first one, prepping the line. Uh, this is something we've kind of realized and understand, you know, we've got a, some pivot points we have to take. And so I want you guys to think back of, of your transition from being a senior airman to a staff sergeant. And I think it's pretty cool, right? You guys are transitioned right now into a highest enlisted grade. But I want you to think about what was your deliberate progression to become responsible from not just yourself but to others? What was your progression? ALS, right? Okay. What else? Did ALS fully prepare you for everything that you needed to do? Now, not, not everything, but, but what do you think? Were you really ready? No. Let me ask these questions. Did you know where base support agencies are at? Not on some quick reference card that you could just hand them and say, call this number. Like, could you actually walk them to where those facilities were? Could you escort anybody? Did, did some of you know where it was at? Yes or no? Raise your hand if you did not know where they, those facilities were at when you got troops. Okay. Okay. Uh, did you understand, had you met the first sergeant, did you understand how discipline had worked in the unit? Yes or no? Okay. Uh, had, you, had you witnessed a feedback session, a counseling session, corrective access session, not just your own, right? <laughs> not just your own. But there's some things that we got to make sure we do. So on, like you think about check ride before on the operational side, right? If we treated this like how we did upgrade training, where it'd be much more deliberate, right? Wouldn't it have been a little bit more beneficial for NCOs in the unit to say, hey, I know you're getting ready to take on these new responsibilities and have that period to make sure they're good on whatever some basic things are that you say are good. We got to be more deliberate with this. What we can't have, look, anybody here, and feel free to discuss, right? Do you think we should just have it where they come back to ALS and there's 15 souls waiting on them and say, hey, good luck. You know what I mean? You'll figure it out. Should that be our default answer? Swim, swim harder. No? Let me ask you this. How many times has that happened to you your entire journey? Congratulations. This squadron is yours. Congratulations. You're part of a command team. Right? We've got to be more deliberate. If we, if we want successful outcomes, we have to be more deliberate. And we specifically think it's important that we start here because we need our NCOs and senior NCOs to be part of the change. If we're going to get to unit level where, where our airmen live every single day, where the Air Force is real to them, we've got to make sure this is right. And so the concept of prepping the line, now I want to say there's two, po there's two parts to this. There's a policy on what the line is, and then there's the, there's the standard on what you need to do to cross the line. Does that make sense? Okay. So, so what we've been working on is actually coming up with like a, a JQS, very similar to how we do upgrade training or certification training, and packaging some things together. Because the challenge right now is people don't even have anything to reference. We don't even do a great job of sharing with our teammates out of what they even got in PME. It's traditionally, hey, how was PME? It was good. You know, did you learn anything? Yeah. Did you guys talk about four lenses? Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, it's the same, it, it, it's got to get deeper than that. And so we can amplify it. And so we'll do a better job of sharing that too, but then to build upon, and this isn't to do what, what PME does, this is to do what is only specific at your unit level. And you guys can always choose to add things. But we're also sensitive to this too, right? We know everybody's busy. We don't want to just put something on there that's some generic requirement. This has to be something that, that we think is, is always value added. And so we're packaging it together, we're considering kind of what's the right messaging, we're sharing it with some groups, and you can see the phases we have here too. Our CAAs are really kind of validating the need with some, some surveys out there, with some populations from our NCO and senior NCO PEZs. And then also our, our CFMs, NCO Academy, senior NCO Academy classes, they're taking a look at this. CFMs are a huge part of this. The CFMs are all about this. They've been briefed this and they're, they're on board. Um, and then what we're trying to do is, is to pilot it in some units first and probably offer it to everybody. The questions on the bottom that are being looked at though is where is the standard? It's about 1% of senior airmen right now in Air Force are Raiders. It's a very, very small number. And so you have to start asking the question is, do you even need senior airmen rated at all? Should, should being responsible for others just be an NCO requirement? Like you can't do that until you're an NCO. You know, should we merge those things together? Um, also looking at the time, right? We, we've done this before. We had separation and the other services have separation at the E4 level, whether that's specialist to corporal, whether that's senior airman to buck sergeant, right? Taking a look at that, is that the right progressive proficiency-based advancement that we need? And so those are things that are going to be evaluated 
uh, and, and some recommendations given to the Chief Master of the Air Force. And so this is what's being looked at today. What I would highlight to everybody in here is you guys could all have something at your unit level right now. You don't have to wait on anybody to do any of this, right? I would ask you to pause and say, hey, do we have anything when they come back from Mammoth Leadership School? Like, are we, do we have any kind of thing where the commanders are involved, where the senior NCOs sit down and get eyeball to eyeball? Like, or, or do we just kind of let people just kind of shed the weight? Um, I would ask us all to kind of pause and take a look at that. Um, it really made me pause that I was never really actively involved in that conversation at the unit level. I mean, I would see people go, I'd talk to them, I'd ask them when they come back, but like the real risk equation of, of you're going to be responsible for others and, and supporting them through that process, we've got to make sure that there's a circle of trust, right? And they know, they know they're supportive on doing something that's probably the most complex job they're ever going to have, taking care of human beings. Okay. The blueprint. So the blueprint, what we're getting after here in the blueprint, so, so the action plan, and this was kind of some challenges to communicate. The action plan is about transformation. The blueprint is about communicating to our airmen the Air Force they have today. That's at their fingertips. We do not want success in our Air Force to be based off timing, luck, circumstance, and who you know. Information has got to be shared. And if you really want to look at an imperative for inclusion, it's how well you share information. It's how well you share information, not just in small communities, not just in your tribe, but how you openly just share information and opportunities with everybody. And so that's what the blueprint is looking to get after. Because we can't also expect you know, our, our frontline leaders to, to know all the stuff that's out there, right? We gotta make it better to be accessible. And so the blueprint is looking to get after that. We tried really, really hard and some inputs is, is, is that you know, to do this best, we thought it would be best on a device or some modern platform, something that was engaging. The, you, saw, you saw earlier in the prior brief, from AFPC, there's a whole data modernization strategy that's going on, and once that gets up to speed, we think this will turn into something we think is called My Blueprint. But for now, we can't wait. We gotta get the information out there. But we wanted to do it in a way that would be somewhat attractive and a little bit different. And so this is, this is gonna be built um, to, to communicate things in a very basic, hey, why do I care about this? Why is this important? And then connect them to resources that have valid resources. There's a lot of airmen who are looking at this stuff and just have no idea this stuff is out there because so much of it is just on email. So much of it is just go search Google. Like, if you had a conversation with somebody about the NDS, the action plan, or the, the action orders, they're like, where would they go find that? Is there like one page where they could just find that? No, you had to go search the internet, right? And then you'll find old versions and all. We just gotta do a better job, of again, of flattening comms. And so you can see we actually do have the draft. A Chief Master of the Air Force and the AFSELC are gonna be presented that this week. She's gonna go look at it right now, maybe, or something else, I don't know. But we did hit that one on time, and they're working to get the review period done. But it is due out, it is in the action plan, and we plan to hit that target in April. Um, some more to come on that. We think it will reside on the leadership library. We also think we go into my eval. A good opportunity here is, is you know, your benefits fact sheet, the blueprint will be right there at somebody's fingertips. And so give an airman access to content and information that could be of use to them. And here's just some samples for you guys to kind of know what it's going to look like. I want it to be visually appealing again, and a lot of the stuff in here will be just interactive links and they go to. So more to come on that. All right, DSD reform. So DSD, how many of y'all hate the spreadsheets that come down every six months? Just curious, okay. We never get this feedback. This is the first time I've heard this. Okay. All right, so we, we noticed, you know, the challenge of DSD from, from where the program originally started it was absolutely essential. We had to be really, really critical about how we brought people on, right, in these key roles that are high influence positions. But our airmen are smart, right? We're all smart. And so what it did start to happen is it, it was a very, very powerful mechanism to get 100% fills in certain communities, okay? In some positions that were historically hard to fill. So the program, it ballooned a little bit. We did have some communities, you remember tech training had, had tapped out and said, hey, listen, we can't, this can't keep up with our needs, so they left. Um, first sergeants are used to a different hiring mechanism, and then the, some of it's kind of a mixed bag with local hires. But the, the, the true intent of the program, it's been really hard to actually message, to communicate what DSD is. And most of our airmen don't even realize there's, there's, like, there's like over 100 other special duties in our Air Force beyond DSD. And they have no idea these tremendous other opportunities, embassies, all this other stuff, they have no idea that's out there. And so 
we've kind of, it's really been hard for us to challenge a message to the front line. And so we had to get better at that. And so we had, we've had work groups where we talked to both airmen who were experienced in DSD, who, who had graduated from DSD, and then all the people who have a hand in the kind of the administrative turn of it. Um, and we kind of narrowed it down to some key things. So the one thing you're going to see too is we got to get out of the business. First effort was we got to get out of the business is spreadsheets. And then we, we erase the data that we, all the work you do at the front line, right? And if you guys are tracking it, it's currently so inefficient, it's five to one ratio on selection. So if I have 10 requirements that I got to fill, I got to find 50 applicants. Does that make sense? So that means I got 40 frustrated airmen who are never going to hear anything at all. And they're going to think like, well, did they board me? Did they look at me? It's not transparent at all. And then you're going to sit down and have that conversation six months later because they never got an assignment, right? Because they're still the right airmen for the job. We've got to get better at that. And so what we're looking at, the team came together and we have capabilities that exist today. How many of y'all are using the DT board tool in my vector right now? Thumbs up, you like it or? Okay, all right, we got some, we got halfways again. We got with Caesars in the house again, okay. But mostly thumbs up. So what we've seen with this tool is it, it, we have the capability to move people into my vector today and there's been a lot of work done in it. And so we think we can get people out of the business spreadsheets and go to where we have again, where airmen are participating in the process with commander's endorsement. It's no longer just a hit list of predetermined names that are going out there with just a yes or no. Because I'd be interested in your feedback too, but a lot of airmen tell us they get selected for DSD that they never found out until when? Until the assignment dropped. We gotta do better than that. That is, that is, a, that is, that is bad on us, all the way around. Um, I can't tell you how many MTIs I had who were single parents deployed when they got that email and said, hey, I wish somebody would have had a conversation with me. I love the Air Force, but I don't know if this is the right time. All right, we, that's, that's breaking trust and we gotta get better there too. And so what we're gonna do is, is looking to narrow it down to force generators, using more modern systems, and then also moving some more larger capabilities. CFMs are gonna be involved in this too, so it's not just quotas, right? It's not like, hey, we're gonna go six months ago and see how many quotas we have. We want it to be live and engaging, and so there's some vision of that too. And then the question I want you guys to think about too, we're not there, but we're thinking about it, is, is promotions. Should promotions in special duties be in your core career field? So if you were serving somewhere else, right, you were a first sergeant, you were NTI, whatever that might be, should you, if you were in maintenance, should you be on the maintenance board? Culturally, there's some people who say, I don't, know, I, don't know if that, I don't know if they're out doing something different that that community would value them, right? There's that question. But statistics would show you when they come back, what happens? They get promoted, right? So again, what are we trying to, what are we promoting here? Are we promoting Air Force chiefs? Are we promoting specialists in those duties, right? Like, I, I think we've got we've to kind of consider that. So that's something that's going to be looked at from a policy perspective. Uh, what the A1 General Kelly has asked us to do is he said, hey, we've got to make sure that if you go and do one of these key duties, that we at a minimum promote you at Air Force averages. Because if you don't historically promote people and give them opportunity, it's really, really hard to recruit somebody for it. Right? So if we want to make sure we're taking care of this talent, we've got to ma manage them all the way through the process. And we've got to make sure they stay connected to their communities. A lot of times your comms out when you go into a special duty, they don't talk to you at all until you come back on the returnee list. Again, that's not talent management. Right? We've got, we got to be, and on DTs, right? You become a senior NCO, you're not getting any feedback on the DT. It's not until you come back. And then in some cases, they tell you to sit the bench for a year. You've got to do a warm-up tour to come back. Right? These are all just real data points that our airmen have told us in these groups that, again, we as chiefs, we can't let it stay there. And so what we're looking at right now is moving to force generators. So this is specifically for the men and women who are involved in these duties, right? Who are involved in, in, in for the airmen we need to recruit, build, and develop the force. And so those other special duties that would be outside of that would move. One thing I want to highlight on here to do that we're looking at is, is taking our career assist advisors and bringing them into the PME world, right? is so as there's changes that happen within PME and your base level courses, right? Your base level courses should not just be like a topic list with a collection of PowerPoints and then the first person to volunteer on the email gets to teach the future generation. Does that make sense? Right, that is not a first come first serve thing. That should be a very deliberate thing on who, we're, who is in there and talking about what is right for our Air Force. And by the way, do we give those people lesson plans? How many of y'all have gone and talked to those seminars? NCO Pez, senior NCO Pez, did they give you a lesson plan? Here's the minimum objectives, nope, right? Did they share with you, here's a SharePoint, we're like the last 10 slides, you guys can assemble whatever you want. 
We, that, is, that, is, that, is, that is Bush League ball, right? We've got to get better there. So bringing it underneath a common umbrella, centralizing it, making sure there's clear standards and expectations, and, and it's going to make sure that, that as anything changes across the continuum, everybody's informed. And you as chiefs should be able to turn to some location and know exactly what's going on in all those classes, right? What the objectives are. That should be shared. So when they come back, you can engage immediately and say, hey, this how it applies to you in our house. Okay, so that's some of the work being done on the development side. Okay, is the DC back yet? No, I'm just gonna keep running. All right, let's go. Okay, the books, the books. So here, here's a couple, of, again, going to this job, you gotta, you gotta kinda ask yourself the question, how do we end up where we were? So this is 2015, General Welsh. He published a version of what was the 1-1, right, the blue book. And, and this book is called The Profession of Arms. And so in this, it also has code of conduct. It, has, it, it definitely emphasizes respect. And this is posted on the PACE webpage. You guys, know, you guys are tracking this? You guys remember when this happened? But here's, here's kind of some challenges. Is that the blue book? What do you guys think, yes or no? What, what's the blue book? What's that? Right. Right? and standards, right, and culture, by the way. It depends on when you look it up. It, it says all of those things. Does that make sense? Right, so, so the original intent of it has kind of become, and it's not really clear to all of us. This one, right? What is that? The Brown Book, right? You guys know that, okay? So anybody have a copy on them right now? Pop quiz, anybody have a copy right now? Okay, what, what date is that? So this is, I'm telling you, 95% of the time we ask this question. If you pull one out, 2009 is the copy that people have. What's the most current version? 18. You guys looking at all your copies right now? The last time we mass produced this was 2009. There are some times you can get your hands on a copy of 18, right? The point is, here's, a, here's another atmospheric. Five years ago in PME, we removed this as a requirement to teach, the Brown Book. It hasn't been taught for five years. If you search, if you search Air Force Handbook 3626.18 online right now, does it look like that? What does it look like? It looks like an AFI. So if I'm new to the Air Force, if, I, if I've come in the last five years, which by the way, that's like 100,000 airmen just for context. You, we all talk about brown books, they have no idea what the hell we're talking about. Because if I look it up online, it doesn't even have a brown cover, right? We all talk about it like it's like an like a old, like, like, you know, mythological thing. But like, it's, it really, we've walked, kind of, we've walked away from it, you know, in many ways. And so we've gotta make sure, that, again, that these things all fit together. We know how, influential this document can be, especially in a period of change, to create some foundational knowledge. And so what we're doing on this front is we're looking at a complete draft of this, like a complete re-edit, and we're also introducing something in the action plan we realize is that, you know, we don't have a lot of understanding of what air power is and how it connects to the joint force. And so that was the idea came up. We got feedback from groups that hey, what if we had something that communicated what joint was at a very, very basic level? I mean, you can, you can definitely dive into joint doctrine, but again, how does air power fit into the joint force? And so the purple book was the concept that came up. And that's actually where we discovered that the brown and the, and the, and the, the, the blue and the brown books, people didn't really have a lot of knowledge of what those were. So we were teaching a lot of times, we were asking questions. And so we're gonna reinvigorate all of those as well. So we make sure that all of them have a specific value that's, that's relevant. And so we're, we're moving through co coordination on both those processes. Brown book is set to be out in April. Uh, purple book is gonna come later on in June. Um, but the key thing we're looking at is it really to our airmen should be very simple. It should all fit together. And so the concept here is the one on the left is AFDP 1 dash 1, right? And so that's where General Brown pushed it back out. This used to be a very, very big, big document. Now it's trimmed down to 20 pages. And that really invigorates and defines what air power is. And so the concept is, is to make this something again where it's simple to our airmen and they go to one place to things that should be foundational and doctrine for us. And we want it to look more like this. Where it doesn't look like it had three pages of legal review before I get into it. Because that's, that's straight up the words, like, we had an airman tell us straight up, like, 
I am looking at the first page and I don't even want to turn it over. Like just real talk, Chief. Well, I appreciate it. Okay, last thing I have for you. So I asked twice and you weren't there. So the person that wasn't there said yes. Are you, it's still nine? Okay, all right, all right. God, I'm, I'm taking it, I'm taking it, I'm going it. All right, he'll yell at me later. So, so ALQs, big, big message I have on you from force, force Development Lens is all freaking day long, do you know what people ask us? What do they want in terms of, of knowing about the ALQs and the new eval system? What's the number one question you think we get? Starts with an N. Narratives. Everybody wants to know what the hell the narrative is going to look like. What I would ask you in your formations is, is, is what we want to make sure we understand here is that it's all got to be about development and substance. We'll figure out style later on. So the ALQ is already out there. We are defining, we are already sharing with, with this is what our Air Force is going to use to evaluate performance. The foundational competencies, which, which is, is, is what we use to develop our airmen, right? We want a supervisor, we want leadership teams focused on developing and maximizing the potential of the teams they have in their units. We want that to be the culture. We want maximizing growth, right? Focused on growth, not focused on promotion. We've been feeding that animal for far too long. How many bullet riding classes do we have compared to how many performance classes? We're feeding that culture, right? It's got to be about, about that person maximizing value within their team, right? Like, so be aware of that too. So right now, the foundational competencies are on the bottom. This will all be captured also in the, uh, in the Brown Book, but focus on developing self, others, organizations, and ideas, and those feed into our ALQs. And so you're going to get this in, in a lot of the, the stuff that's coming out, both the Blueprint and the Brown Book. You can't give me five minutes, DC? Okay, five minutes. Can I have five minutes, please? Okay. Well, he has, he has, yeah, yeah. Okay, so a couple questions if you have, if we have a couple, little bit of time, if anybody has any questions. Or thoughts or comments. Good morning, this Good morning. is Senior Week from Nellis. I love the idea of all these supervisor skills that we're getting ready to build, but we already have a five-week platform called Airman Leadership School. Mm -hmm. Why are we adding additional requirements when we already have a platform built for building leaders? Yeah, so, so to answer that question, what, we're not, what we want to do is the five-week platform, we're not, we're not necessarily going to, that, we're going we're gonna to build on top of that, okay? I want to I make sure that's clear. And really, it's to utilize what happened in ALS, so that JQS, is really just gonna have the content that, that was in there. And just, you're gonna have the final say. And so I don't want you guys thinking it's like an additional five week course at the unit, all right? So the unit will be able to kind of figure out what they wanna do for standards, but it's primarily gonna be built around uh, recognition and discipline, unit mission, sponsorship, okay, at the unit level, uh, and then base support agencies. Those are kind of the key things we wanna check ride before we say a supervisor is good to go. Does that make sense? It's not gonna be like an extra course. Sorry, just a follow-up. So a lot of us are complaining about our senior men, staff sergeant, staff sergeant selects coming back and it's like, what did you learn? There's no like applicable skills that we see coming back. And so it would be nice to see these airmen coming back with skills they can no kidding use to lead their airmen. Yep. Um, so I don't know if I'm the only person with that frustration. You're not, you're okay. not. yeah, you're not. Yeah, so w w with us, with the emphasis to get so strategic, right? and push a lot of that knowledge into ALS. The core kind of hard skills on X's and O's that they needed to do, that stuff walked away. And so, and so those things we know we've got to get back into Airman Leadership School, uh, but then also it's got to be complemented at the unit level. Um, one thing I just kind of want to share with you guys also is we're looking at is creating a, like a core uh, CFETP for across the board for all career fields. And so the CFMs are working us on that. So what we need to be able to do is that we can look across I want, to, I want to be able to grab something and say, hey, what happens when and where? And is that the right amount, right? Are we getting too far into strategic stuff and we're not equipping them with the tactical skills they need? Okay, so that's an effort we're working across the board with all the CFMs, but you're exactly right. We're out of balance right now. One more question. And I'll, I'll head your guys' way during the break. Hey, this is uh, Senior Master Sergeant Sullivan from AFSENT. I uh, have more of a statement than a question, but I don't know how this happens, but every time we renew the EPR, Everybody in this room, guarantee it. If you don't disagree with me, if you disagree with me, you're a liar. Um, looks at the EPR and is like, 
oh, sweet, they're going to take away bullets. I know I'm not going to have to write 29 million bullets on this, on this thing. And then we get it, and it's the same amount, uh, same amount of bullets. Um, I think changing to narrative, I think that's great. It may, may, may save some time there. But what everybody really wants is not to spend time trying to make up stuff on people's EPRs or taking two EPR or taking one bullet and making it into two bullets. That's where we waste so much time and energy. This isn't a spear. I know I probably sound passionate. I am passionate about this. But um, it's just really I just want to hit that, hit that home is I will hate myself if I leave here without saying it. We need to save time so we can spend more time leading our airmen and doing things that are great in our unit, not spending time writing EPRs and spending a ton of time on these, especially when we have the SCODs where we have our say, where we can go in there and communicate how well that person is performing in that way. Um, that's all I'm going to say. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, so when, 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 when Chief Crowder talked about, you know, the people in A1 don't live to uh, just make airmen's lives miserable, that, that's the exact sentiment of what's going on with the work groups for the narratives. Like, we want to make sure that this is something where we don't have to, like, create this separate style to be able to just capture whatever we're doing, right? And so that is going to be a big thing that we're getting after in the group. So if anybody has any questions for me, I'll take them during the break. But uh, DC, it's 9.05, and over to you, my brother.